How'd you like to listen to .NET Rocks with no ads? Easy. Become a patron. For just $5 a month, you get access to a private RSS feed where all the shows have no ads. $20 a month will get you that and a special .NET Rocks patron mug. Sign up now at patreon.netrocks.com. Hey, Carl and Richard here. As you may have heard, NDC is back, offering their incredible in-person conferences around the world. And we'd like to tell you about them. NDC Oslo will be May 21st through the 25th. Go to ndcoslo.com to register. NDC Copenhagen is happening August 27th through the 31st. The early bird discount for NDC Copenhagen ends June 2nd. Go to ndccopenhagen.com for more information. NDC Porto is happening October 16th through the 20th. The early bird discount for NDC Porto ends July 21st. Go to ndcporto.com to register. And check out the full lineup of conferences at ndcconferences.com. Hey, guess what? It's .NET Rocks. Wow. I'm Carl Franklin. And I'm Richard Campbell. What do you know? <laughs> Just happened again. It's so strange. I know. 1,843 times that we've done this stupid show. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's that stupid, but you know. No, it's not that I, stupid. I haven't done that many. I'm a slacker. I'm the new guy. <laughs> we were just talking about podcasts and the pod in podcast. I always have to explain to, you know, and well, that's because there are no iPods anymore, right? Like that yeah. product's gone. That's right. That's what it stood for. It yeah. was iPods were the, were the device of the day. Yeah. It's just like, you know, Microsoft had channel nine, which was based on United airlines channel right. nine, where if you're flying United, you could switch to channel nine. You could listen to the United doesn't do that anymore. So <laughs> yeah. like nobody knows what channel nine means. Right. It's gone. <laughs> it's just funny. People, People would say, hey, have you heard about podcasts? And I say, no. No. I, no, I, <laughs> no idea. It's this right. thing. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's just a little weird. All right. Let's roll the crazy music for Better Know Framework. Awesome. All right, man, what do you got? All right, well, I'm talking about uh, the .NET show, which is a video show that I do. It's, it's presented by DevExpress. Right. And it's all about MAUI right now. And I don't mm -hmm. mean their tools, just general MAUI stuff. And I started building, in Xamarin Forms, I started building a .NET Rocks mobile podcast, speaking of podcasts, right. a, a, a client app, right? for iOS and Android. And then when Maui came out, I started rebuilding it because there was no converting it. And that was just silly. It's a different approach. Different approach, different project structure and everything. So we just started over. And um, we got to four episodes on that. And the, the app doesn't really look all that great right now, but it's functional. Right. So I figured this is the time to start the process of publishing to the App Store. What is oh. involved you know, lots of moving parts. <laughs> lots of moving parts, and I realize that I'll be in update hell forever. Yeah, but you got to start somewhere. So this, um, it, you know, this is episode eighteen forty three. So if you go to eighteen forty three dot pop dot me, that'll bring you to a YouTube uh, video uh, where I go and register. Yes, brand new accounts right. in Google Play. You know, Google Developer and yeah. in Apple Developer. So for the two app stores. Yeah, the two app stores. So I'm awesome. starting from scratch. And both of them require a waiting period where you have to get approved. And so the following week, then we'll pick up where we left off. And we're nice. just going to go through the entire process, warts and all. Yeah, we'll get right through it until you see your thing appear in the store. And, exactly. And then start looking at updating it and how much fun that is. Absolutely. I can't wait for that. That's going to be the show, right? Okay. You published it. Well, and also, like, what if they turn you down, right? Like, you're yeah. almost almost tempted to put in something inappropriate in it just to see if they will turn it down. Oh, Richard, don't give me any ideas because, you know. <laughs> it's all an experiment and a test, man. You might as well try test the limits of the system. Well, I am really interested in what happens when you want to update, right? Yeah. Because I know that there's pain around that. I've heard Time that. Time is the whole thing, especially when Apple updates their OS and it breaks your app. And all you need to do is recompile and redeploy. Yes. 
but that still takes time. Yeah. We had that problem with the last app that we had, which by the way, is no longer out there. So it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. For um, various reasons, but this is going to be our .NET rocks app and I'm going to document the whole process of publishing it and uh, getting it in the app store. Awesome. That's what I'm doing. Okay. So part one, know it, learn it, love it. Who's talking to us today, Richard? Grabbed a comment after show 1659, the one we did with one Jennifer Waddell. I remember, Jen. Oh, yeah. Uh, we were talking about modernized Angular apps, and it certainly dug into Cypress and a bunch of other testing frameworks and so forth. But that was back in 2019. So that's the before time. As we say in New, in New England, she's wicked smart. Yes, it's true. She is. Wicked, wicked smart. Uh, and... Uh, the comment comes from Red Dorian, who says, I have worked with Cypress in anger for more than a year. And this oh. is now three years ago or four years ago. And I feel safe enough to comment on its usage and performance. I wouldn't consider it a replacement for unit tests. It has greater functionality in the end-to-end testing or automating user testing. As with all testing, there's a balancing act of how much you, testing you do. And the more testing you do with Cypress, the longer your builds can take. And I'm talking adding anywhere between five and 20 minutes to a build. As you gain more experience with it, you learn where and what to test, but it's definitely an accompaniment to unit testing with Karma, but not necessarily an alternative. Now, again, four years ago, so the tools have evolved. The infancy of a technology is a factor that definitely needs to be taken into account before jumping on the latest and greatest. Such is the cost of living on the bleeding edge. The cost of living on the bleeding edge is bleeding. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, man, did you just uh, do that yourself? Did you add that in or is that actually? Oh, okay. (laughs) little commentary from Peter Cowley. A little editorialization there. (laughs) But uh, Well, Red, we're about to introduce you to the newer versions of of Cypress because things have evolved. And it's great that you're on board back in in, uh, 2019, 2020. Because uh, it's always good to have a view back of where things started. And I appreciate your thinking around how you mix stuff up. And that the price of testing, you know, that that additional time is worth it. Because it makes Mm -hmm. for a more reliable software. Absolutely. So a copy of Music Code By is on its way to you. And if you'd like a copy of Music Code By, write a comment on the website at .netrocks.com. Or on the Facebooks, we publish every show there. And if you comment there and I read it on the show, we'll send you a copy of Music Code By. By the way, Music to Code By has another brand music to flow by that's not just for developers and i will also build an app for that and put that in the app store once i get the dotnet rocks thing in there that's gonna be fun and you know you can definitely follow us on twitter if you want to but i think the cooler place to hang out these days is mastodon so richard and i are both there i'm at carl franklin at techhub.social and i'm rich campbell at mastodon.social so send us a toot and uh, join join the tutors. All the toots. Yeah, all the toots. And, you know, I, I think I've resigned myself to not making up a joke right there. <laughs> I, just, I think I'm done. That joke yeah. is done. Yeah. Send yeah. us a toot. That's about it. All right. So let us introduce Eli here. Eli Lucas is the head of developer ecosystem at Cypress and has been doing software development for over 25 years. After spending the first 15 years doing .NET development, Eli moved more to the front-end world and has been drinking the TypeScript Kool-Aid ever since. Lately, he's been focused on sharing techniques on producing better quality software with testing at the heart of it. He lives in Denver with his wife and four kids, and when not developing, can be found taking his chaos on tour around the Colorado mountains and probably breathing more heavily than you want him to. <laughs> because it's all that I, altitude. I've been to Denver, and I couldn't even breathe. Now, actually, it was in Breckenridge that I really lost my breath. That's above Denver, isn't it? Yes, it is. Well, anyway, welcome, Eli. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. It's one way to keep four kids settled down, deprive them of oxygen. Absolutely. And then make them run around. The coolest Good combination. Yeah, we actually... We actually do that every year. We take them up. We go up uh, for a week during the summer to Breckenridge every year. So it's good. There you go. At Breckenridge was so cool. They have the in the grocery stores, they have containers of oxygen that you can buy for a couple of bucks. And, you know, anytime you feel like that, you just put that on and you feel better. It's crazy. Nice. Yeah. Pressurized oxygen in the grocery store. <laughs> so, 3,000 meters up. That's legit. Oh, yeah. It's 14,000 feet, something like 10, that. 10,000? Yeah, something like that. Denver's 9,000. So I thought Breckenridge was... I thought Denver was five. Yeah, All right, 5280. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mile High City. That's All why right. it's the Mile High City. Yeah. All right, okay. 
Correct me on my math. That's right. It's been a while. I, as I said, I was oxygen deprived when I was there. There so you go. <laughs> I didn't make too many memories that stuck around. Um, Eli, tell us about Cypress and what it is. I mean, we've talked about it on the show before, but I'd like you to explain it for everybody who may not have heard about it. Yeah, absolutely. So for those of you who may not know what Cypress is, uh, we are a uh, free open source a utility that you can use to test anything that runs inside of the browser. Um, and so our bread and butter has been pretty much into end testing. That's what people primarily know us for. Uh, a few years back, we came onto the scene as being a quick, easy way to get into end testing up and running inside your apps. Okay. And uh, I guess it's in the category of testing tools, but as it works, as it works inside the browser, does it integrate with uh, IDEs? How, how does that work? So the primary way that people work with Cypress is is through our our tool um, that you download and install. And so the, to kind of go back into like how you get started with Cypress is that it's an npm installation that you install into you, typically your front end portion of your project. Okay. And then once you fire it up, it um, opens up a a desktop application that you can use to start running your tests and whatnot. And so there might be like plugins and whatnot out there that you can use inside of your IDE, but our primary interface is through this desktop application that you use. All right. Very cool. And so do you have any um, answer to the, the message that Richard read there? It was granted four years ago, but I, I mean, I take it things have changed a little bit. Yeah, four years ago, man, so much has changed since then. Um, and if I recall, like the context around the message was around unit testing, maybe something about comparing testing type tools. Yeah, he, he was just saying that he's doing unit testing uh, elsewhere. Yeah, right. Not doing unit, unit testing with Cypress, which I wouldn't disagree with. Yeah. Yeah. So that's one of the things like with Cypress, you can really test anything that runs inside of the browser. Right. And so if you're testing your front end code, uh, your JavaScript that runs inside the browser, you can definitely do so with Cypress. It's not necessarily what we come out and advertise that it's possible. Um, but you can do it. Um, what you would typically use for something like that is like Jest, um, right. or Mocha directly, uh, to do those types of things. And the test runners to do unit type tests are probably better suited. Like Jess is probably better suited for unit testing than Cypress is. Right. But I suppose an advantage as you get if you wanted to do unit testing with Cypress is that now you're all underneath one tool with one set of APIs, one one learning curve um, to get everything done. Uh, as they say in the enterprise world, one throat to choke. <laughs> <laughs> is that inappropriate? I don't know. I don't think so. It's a term. It's a term we use. It's pretty accurate. Yeah. All right, but yeah, if we go back to you know, in the time frame that Red's talking about, that late 2019, early 2020, you really are talking about even before V1 of Cyprus, or maybe or maybe just V1, V2. Yeah, it was it was towards the earlier days. I'm not too sure what version would have been out because we yeah. come out with versions fairly rapidly. Yeah, it's yeah impressive. Did you, so you guys had a major version number, three version version numbers last year. 10, 11, and 12. Like, right. Are you changing that much? <laughs> um, it's mostly, well, so we follow semantic versioning. Uh -huh. Um, so when we come up with something that needs to be released, that's going to require, um, people to either update their codes or our APIs are changing. You know, basically we're releasing a breaking change is when we determine when we have to do a major version versus some type of shipping schedule. Right. Uh, we, we do know towards the end of last year, cause I think we released V11 and like, December and then V12, like a month or two later in January, February. Hey, wow. And that was pretty quick, um, even for us. Um, but it's what we needed to do to kind of like hit, um, some of these feature releases that we wanted to do. But the big one was, uh, V10. Okay. And mm -hmm. that was the one where we had a major UI refresh because pretty much the UI hasn't changed at all, um, oh. since, uh, Cypress was originally released. And so the, the UI of the application got a total rehaul. But along with that, we released a new type of testing that you could do with Cypress called component testing. Oh, okay. So what do you mean when you say component testing? Yeah. So 
specifically, we're talking about the front end frameworks that are component based. So your Angular, React, Vue, right. any of these ones that kind of promote a component driven architecture where you break down the UI of your application into small components that are reusable. Um, across the app. And so being able to test those on their own, not necessarily dependent on a given page. Exactly. Yeah. So you're taking those components, you're mounting them in isolation from the the rest of the app. And then Mm -hmm. that way you can write tests that are just specifically for that widget versus like normally what you'd have to do if you want to write tests to it, somehow throw it into the context of another page where it's going to be used. I don't know. I, I, we've built test pages with all of the components on it Mm -hmm. and then written the tests around that test page. It creates its own kind of hell. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And so this component testing is to get you out of that hell and to bring you to the light. All right. Yeah. Being able to just test them discreetly. Like when I think componentization of controls, I think React especially is good at that. Mm -hmm. Like that seems to be their one of their claims to fame is very much that component mindset of style, function, all of that is all sort of bundled together. Yeah. uh, On the JavaScript side, most of the, um, all the modern, um, JavaScript frameworks subscribe to some type of component based architecture. Right. And, and so we have official support for Angular, Vue, um, React, and Svelte. Okay. And then we also have the ability for the community to make their own uh, mounting libraries. Cause it is an open source project. Yep. It is an open source project. And we have a pretty vibrant community and ecosystem of people developing plugins for Cypress. Hmm. Right. Nice. And so we, um, a couple of minor releases back, we, um, exposed an API that if you're a community, like, so for instance, uh, quick is a newer front end framework that's coming out. Q U I C Q U I K I K because yeah. names are hard. Yep. And did Nestle give them any problems? <laughs> Isn't that the name of that chocolate let me, drink? Yeah. <laughs> let me let me double check that's the spelling. But oh, so. Q W I K. Q W I K. Yeah. Because spelling things is hard. <laughs> it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And searching for things like that is even harder. Oh yeah. No kidding. And try having a podcast with a period in the I'm, that begins. Yeah, with, with a period. period as the first character. Like, what could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm and I'm adding these all to the show notes. So I need I do want to find them all just so that folks can can look them up easily on the show. Yeah. But uh, yeah, it's good to have quick in there. I, I haven't looked at quick. It's another one. Yeah. So a uh, quick is um, being headed up by somebody who was one of the founders of angular. Uh, Misco. Oh, wow. Yeah. Hey. Misco, um, Misco from the angular team uh, is working on quick along with some of my old colleagues. I used to work at a company called ionic and some of my old colleagues oh, yeah. from ionic are also working on it. Yeah. All right. Uh, Because there was the Ionic framework back in the day too. Not that it's gone away. No, no. Ionic's still around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's, that's an example of another, like, you know, really new. Um, I think they just released their first RC a couple of weeks ago. Um, but they're kind of, um, disrupting the front end industry with yet another JavaScript framework, but making (laughs) massive strides in performance and developer experience and Mm. all that fun stuff. But now the folks at Cypress no longer have to debate, do we add quick support? The API means if quick wants to be supported in Cypress, they can do it themselves. Exactly. Yeah. And we were actually working with the quick team and their developer advocates and whatnot to get the library written and we're promoting it together. Nice. But yeah, because when we, when we work on our own mounting library that is an offic- officially a part of the product. There's a lot to go along with that. We have mm-hmm. all the documentation, all of our examples, like show, show it also. Right. Yeah. But that's what it takes to, for folks to be successful with it, right? It's like you, you guys have got a template for here's the things you need to do so that someone can use Cypress successfully with your web framework. Exactly. I like it. Yeah, it's, it, it, it speaks to our responsible approach to, uh, to allowing people to be successful with their, with their tools. Yeah, definitely. Because goodness knows we don't have enough JavaScript frameworks. <laughs> <laughs> Did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. I apologize. All right. So the component testing is obviously a big piece and being able to do that discreetly. Uh, other particular kinds of testing? I mean, you guys are famous for end-to-end. Yep. So like, like I said, end-to-end is primarily what we're known for. Uh, yeah. We're making a splash in the component testing scene. Um, something else that's really interesting that is starting to gain a lot of interest that you can do with Cypress is API testing. Okay. <laughs> and so we've had the ability, uh, because we have a method that you can use to make HTTP requests to a backend server. Um, right. 
inside of our API for the longest time. And people have been using that to, um, write, uh, integration style tests to a backend API. So you make the request and then you can check the contents, check the status codes and the headers and all that fun stuff to make sure that you expect them to be what they are. Uh, but we had a community member make a new plugin that's called the Cypress plugin API that actually gives you a nice interface that shows you um, the contents of the body, the headers, all this other fun stuff. And so if you ever use something like Postman, it's kind of taking Postman, but putting it inside of uh, the Cypress testing application. And so you use it, not only are you getting the benefits of like visualizing your API requests, but at the same time, you're getting a set of tests that go along with it as well. Nice. So sort of sets a standard for all the things you should be testing on an API. Yeah. And did that get introduced in 10 as well? Uh, so that, that is a community plugin. Right. Um, I think it requires V10, um, because it, that's when the API has its own UI that comes along with it and, and whatnot. And so, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Now, and I found, um, Philip's, uh, repository for it. So just include that in the show notes too. People can go and grab it. Yeah. Philip's one of our great ambassadors. Yeah. It's awesome. And it, and it, it just so it's, it seems to me like ten because you you created tooling around letting the community be more effective with you is why it's such a big version. So what happened in eleven and twelve? Okay, so the big thing was with Cypress eleven. So Cypress ten released the beta version of component testing, right? Mm. And Cypress eleven brought component testing out of beta into general availability, and with that there were some API changes and stuff that we wanted to make uh, to get it out. Cypress 12 uh, was a bit uh, bigger of a release, and that saw a couple of features that our community have been asking for for a real long time. Hmm. And so one of them was the way that Cypress is architected is that when you write your tests, instead of like driving like a web browser via like a protocol or anything like that, we actually take your test code and inject it inside of your application. Okay. And so the test code has direct access to all the HTML and the buttons and the elements and the DOM. Right. That would. Uh, but because of the way that we're running, we had security issues when you ch- had to go to another domain to do something. Yeah. No, that makes sense because it looks like code injection, right? Yep. Yep. The only difference between you and a regular man in the middle of the track is you're the good guys. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise. It's the same thing. Uh, so we figured out a way that uh, we could actually get around that. And that's what we call Origin is the new API. And with Origin inside of your test, when you're about ready to transfer to a new domain. So a common use case for this is third-party authentication. Right. Damn. And so you click a login button. You're going to go over to like Google or an auth provider like Auth0 or Okta. Mm-hmm. And inside of your code, you use site.origin. You're like, hey, I'm about, we're about ready to make an origin change to this new domain name. Everything that's inside of the site.origin block execute inside of that new domain name. And so that'll take that code, put it into the new one. And then when you come back to your website, you exit the site.origin and you're able to do that. But this makes it possible because uh, we had a limitation before that you couldn't go to a new domain and do anything. You had to like work away, work yourself around it programmatically. But right. now you can actually just use the website like a normal user would. Yeah, that was my next question is how much JavaScript does one have to know to effectively use Cypress? Yeah. So writing your tests in Cypress is either written with JavaScript or TypeScript. Um, but We've written the API in a way that it's more like, I, I like to think of it as like a DSL, a domain specific language into testing. And so we have an API that is very fluent and chains off of each other. And so when you write the test, they kind of read a lot like English. And so the first thing that you're going to want to do is like select something, um, inside of your site. And so you'll use a selector and a method to do so. And the primary way to you do that is with the get method. And so you say site.get and then you pass in some type of selector and the selectors are a lot like jQuery selectors. And so you can select via class name, via ID, via elements, attributes and whatnot. And we have best practice guides on how to do this in a, in a good way. But then you select your element and then you take some type of action on it. And so like, let's say you select a button and now you want to do something, you want to click it. And so you call the click method. And then after that, you want to run an assertion. And so you have the assertion that is should, 
And so you say dot should, and then you say like should have been clicked or, you know, text should equal whatever result you're expecting to be. But when you're looking at the code itself, it's very English like. And because of that, we have a lot of kind of QA teams that aren't necessarily developers, but they just know enough to go in there and be able to write test the Cypress. Uh, and if your app becomes really big and you, you're constantly adding functions and functionality, that QA team's going to have to grow too, isn't it? Um, yeah. And so th- we got, we do have certain ways to be able to organize your, your code. Um, and we have a mechanism that we call custom commands. And this is where you can create your own command method that chains off of the Psi object. And so you can actually use it as part of its fluent syntax. Um, but one example might be like, you need to log into your app. Um, that's a common thing that you have to do. So you don't right. want to put that code in every single test that you need to do that in. Mm-hmm. And so you can create a custom login command that will do your login for you. And then you can say login, and then you can say dot get the avatar that shows that you're logged in. Okay. So way to a bypass I now, and I've played with Cypress. I think we use the recorder primarily. Is that still a thing? Yep. Yeah. So that's called Cypress studio mm-hmm. and it's an experimental feature right now. Um, has been since it's came out. Um, so there is a flag that you have to turn on inside of the configuration. Um, but with that, you can use it to record your actions against a website. And so okay. you can go through, do a bunch of clicking. And then at the very end, you can right click on something and add an assertion. You could be like, this text should equal what I expect it to be. And it will record that. Right. And it's just writing the DSL under the hood for you. Yep. Yeah. It, it actually takes the Cypress code, puts it inside of a JavaScript file along with all your other tests. And then from there, that can get you like, you know, 80% of the way there to a complete test. And from there, you can just go in and modify um, the JavaScript directly. It, right now, the tool doesn't go back and modify an existing test if it's previously recorded. Right. So not re-entrant. It just generates your initial impact pass and then you tweak it. Correct. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. And that was one of, that was <laughs> one of those things. And so in Cypress 10, since we redid the entire UI, w- one of the shortcuts that we took was actually getting rid of Cypress Studio. Right. <laughs> and w- we got a ton of feedback, uh, from that. I think a lot of people were relying on the, on the recorder, man. Like that's. Yeah. Yeah. What'd you replace it with? One of the subsequent releases, we, we did put that back in there. So there you go. Oh, uh, okay. Well, what, what were you going to replace it with something? What was the idea? So it's, a, it's an, it's always been an experimental feature since it's uh, yeah. first came out. And that's because like, while it is useful, we do know that it has quite a bit of limitations as, as far as like, usually you do have to go in and kind of modify the code to get it to do exactly what you want it mm-hmm. to do. And you can't, like I said, you can't change previous tests with it. So expectations were too high, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's, a, it's one thing that we find is that it's a great learning tool because uh, yeah. you can use it and go through and do things and then see the code that it's writing for you and be like, oh, okay, that's, that's how you do this. And right. this is how you, it's, yeah. Provided that the code you're generating is the best practice code. Yeah. Then you're going to teach us best practice code just by starting to generate. But it, I love this whole getting over the blank screen syndrome. So you mm-hmm. run a write a test. Mm-hmm. Here's mm-hmm. a blank screen. Have a good time. Yep. Mm-hmm. So being able to use the recorder, sort of lay down the initial template of this is the page. Here are the fields. Here's the assertion. Go. Now you go in and say, all right, well, I want to tinker with the login this way and I want to deal with this thing that way. And like there's a bunch of tweaking you do, but at least you're starting with a template. Mm-hmm. And guys, hold that thought for this very important pause for these very important messages. We'll be right back. Hey, guess what? It's .NET Rocks. Uh, I'm Carl Franklin. That's my friend Richard Campbell. Hey. And we're talking to Eli here about uh, Cypress. And my next question, if you haven't guessed, is uh, any plans to support Blazor? Oh, man. So WebAssembly all up? Like, how do you support testing in WebAssembly? Yeah. Or even Blazor components, uh, server components. Yeah, so it's a multi, multi-faceted multi question. So on the one end with end-to-end testing, Cypress can test anything that runs inside of the browser. Sure, sure. And so if you fire up a development server and you hit a Blazor web app, and even if it's running WebAssembly, it's going to run inside of the browser. Mm-hmm. And you'll be able to do it that way. The more interesting question is doing component testing. Mm-hmm. 
web blazer. Because typically what we will do is we will load up the component inside along with our um, test code and mount the component directly. And then you can modify any of the properties or inputs that are going into the component and mess around with its API directly, which could be a challenge mm-hmm. with Blazor. Like we could probably figure it out. Um, we haven't heard a whole lot of interest um, with that yet, but I have definitely thought about it. Um, and the and the more interesting challenge might be if it's just a flat out server based Blazor app, mm, right? Or everything's rendered yeah. directly on the server. Yeah, exactly. That that's that's an interesting dilemma, isn't it? Because there are some testing frameworks for Blazor, but they're like B Unit is the unit testing framework for Blazor. Yeah, end to end testing of a of a Blazor app. That's an interesting problem. It needs to be done. It's just a question of what you know. What can you hook to? Snapshot testing. You know, Simon Crops tools, good for that. Verify. Right. Just comparing code. But, uh, and, and Richard's observation about WebAssembly, does that throw a monkey wrench in your plans? Uh, no, uh, I don't think so because we, we use real browsers to uh, run our tests with. And so mm-hmm. there are browsers that are installed locally on, on the system that you're using to test it. Yeah. Right. One of the, one of the very first questions you get as you're firing up Cypress is like, Hey, what browser do you want to test in? Right. And so we have support for, um, all the Chromium based browsers. So mm-hmm. Chrome at, and Chrome and Edge, uh, mm-hmm. mainly, uh, support for Firefox. And then recent here recently, we also have experimental support for Safari. Um, so that, that's another flag that you have to turn on to be able to use it. That was another feature well, that we're. Goodness knows it needs some testing. <laughs> I was waiting for that <laughs> comment. <Richard. laughs> yeah. As soon as he said Safari, but, R- Richard's brow furrowed and he was like, Oh, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So, but WebAssembly is interesting because, you know, the code's running in that little sandbox and the, the only JavaScript that you can look at is what's outside the sandbox. And, uh, you know, who knows what yep. it's written in. Yeah. And for that, it should be probably end-to-end testing is going to be your end. best bet because then the Cypress tool is just going to interact with the HTML yeah, that gets right. outputted from the yeah. Blazor app. However it's uh, generated. Directly. Which yeah. is easier in some senses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So testing with Cypress is very black box. Like Cypress really should not know a whole lot about the internals that's going on. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a proper point of ext- abstraction. I don't want to yeah. know. It's all implementation details. You should be testing your application just like your user would actually use it. Right. And where that starts to break down a little bit is with component testing, because with component testing, you need to know a little bit about how your application works. You need to know like what framework it's written in, how to pass in properties to the components and whatnot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But really, as soon as you have it mounted, it's just like an end-to-end test. It gets rendered inside of the browser. And then you can start. It's the plumbing of forcing a, a rendering so that you can test it. Yes. That's crossing into the line, poking underneath the covers a little bit to say, okay, I need to, I need you to make one of these for me so I can beat on it. Mm-hmm. So that's a bit more specific. You, I mean, you almost wonder if WebAssembly, the standard is going to evolve to provide for capabilities for more testability and so forth in, in that level. And I mean, it's right. not there yet, but I can see that being the path because i think wa has particular application in like internal apps and things like that where they want they they want their developers to work in the environment they know and they want that code to be well tested so i imagine it's going it's going to continue to evolve that's a lot of moving parts i mean how much how much impact do you have when a browser does an update like how does that affect cypress um not not a whole lot, especially with how frequently they all come out with newer versions nowadays. Right. Um, it's pretty rare that we'll be like, oh, a new browser, browser came out and broke everybody's tests that were using that browser. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> that That is something. On, on your desktop, it's a little bit harder to control your browser versions and whatnot. But if you're running your tests in like CICD... Yeah. Uh, uh, we actually, Cypress actually provides Docker images that you can use uh, along with your CI CD that has browsers included with it. And so if you needed to set like a browser at a certain version, you can just use that Docker image for it. And then- nice. So one of the gotchas of modern web programming, especially with spas, right? With, with single page applications is that elements just come and go. You know, they're mm-hmm. there and then they're not there. And when you create them, they're not there. You have to wait before they render, before they show up. So 
does uh, Cyprus have any issues with with spas in in particular? You know, what if the IDs are dynamically generated? God forbid. I mean, I don't know who would do that, but I, you know, I can think of evil ways to 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 throw a monkey wrench in there. Um, it, do we have to add specific attributes to things in order to find elements? And what happens if they're not there? I mean, how do you handle those things? Yep. Okay. Yeah. So I'll, I'll tackle that in two parts. I would say the first part, like how how to handle things when they're not there might be like one of the original reasons why Cypress was invented. Ooh, I like uh, this. Because Wait a minute, let me get my popcorn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because okay, okay, before ahead. Cypress um, and the and the testing solutions that were out there, this was like one of the very big problems. You try to yeah. select something that wasn't there, and then all of a sudden your test would fail. And so you'd have to put in these weights into your code. Yeah, Be like, hey, I did the API request. Let's wait a second for everything to show up. Oh, it's not there yet. Let's wait another second. Set timeout, 10 milliseconds, call myself. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Like your um, 10 millisecond optimism, right? Yeah. It's like, you know, maybe it might be a minute. Yeah. It's got to go and actually render the page. And so this made, this made the read, or writing and reading the code more complex than what it needed to be. And then also just introduce this level of flakiness to the test. Like sometimes it's going to work. Sometimes it's not going to work. Uh, Cypress with its API has built in waiting and retryability. Right. Nice. And what I mean by that is if you say, Hey, using the Cypress get method, if you say, Hey, go get me a button with like maybe some particular text in it, like login. If that doesn't exist yet, Cypress is going to wait up to four seconds for that to actually pass. Hmm. That's enough time. And so that gives. Yeah, that's usually enough. And that's completely configurable, too. You can do it at a global level. You can do it at a test level. But one would argue if it's more than four seconds, it's not going to happen. <laughs> the customer left anyway. Nobody cares about your rendering. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, but along with that, we also have built-in retryability. Mm, and right. so let's let's say we have a scenario where we're looking at a list of users, and we go to delete one of the users. So we delete uh, the user. We hit the delete button. And now we're waiting for the row to disappear. Mm. And so we're going to write a test that says, Hey, get me this row and it should not exist anymore. Right. right. Well, initially it might still exist. Sure. Uh, but we're going to notice that and we're going to wait and then retry, um, the assertion again up to four seconds. And, and if for some reason, yeah. Yep. And if for some reason that DOM element is still there after four seconds and we fail the test, we'd be like, yeah, you said you're going to delete this record, but it didn't yeah. actually get deleted. Right. Even that's if it cool. did eventually leave, just took you ten seconds to know how to re- to re-render it. Has gone. That's that's mm-hmm. very very cool. Um, and you need that kind of stuff because spas, man, they're just a whole different beast than yeah. your standard. There's a lot of latency in them. Yeah, and just like the dynamic nature of them, things are there and then they're not there and then they're there again. Yeah, and then their IDs uh, have changed. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And the second. The second part was about IDs and yeah. like how, how do you actually find your elements? Uh, so what, what we actually recommend is you don't use constructs like IDs or class names to find the elements of your application. Hmm. I have two schools of thought. I have the official Cypress best practices guide, and then I have what I think is best practices, and I'll give you the Cypress version first. Okay. Uh, the Cypress version is to use a special attribute, uh, data dash at- attribute, like data dash test ID. Mm. Um, to go and find the particular elements that you're looking for. That's great. It doesn't exist for any other reason. Yep, exactly. Right. Hide, hide away from the rest of the system. I like that. Yeah. And and the problems with using something like ID is that a developer, uh, sometimes a developer and a tester are two different people. Developer yes. may not necessarily know this ID is being used for something. They might change right. it. And then all of a sudden, yep. test break. Yep. Then also great. you have class names um, have the exact same problem, but then a, a lot of the times with... Um, our JavaScript libraries, those class names are being dynamically generated and have like mm-hmm. GUIDs at the end of them and stuff like that. So those aren't reliable to use either. And also we moved from bootstrap, you know, 0. 0.0 to bootstrap seven and all the class names have changed. Yep. Yeah. Everything. Boom. Yep. Yeah. So I get, I love it. I mean, you're basically saying this attribute is for this purpose only and that's it. We're not going to share any other attribute or construct with anyone else. Right. Makes sense. Yep. And so in the React ecosystem, um, the most popular way to test um, React components until Cypress takes over. 
<laughs> is uh, called React Testing Library. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you caught that, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> caught a mid-drink. <laughs> I almost did a spit take. Until yeah. the coming revolution. <laughs> <laughs> Dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Just let that one hang in there. All right. The React but, uh, Testing Library. Yeah, React Testing Library. Uh, mm-hmm. They have a philosophy that um, the way that you select elements should be a, around the same way that a real user would find an element on the screen. Mm-hmm. And a real user could at the same time be something like a screen reader. Yeah, and nice. so because of that... Instead of using something like a data dash attribute, like I just said, we might use something like the role that the right. attribute, the aria role that the attribute plays. And so like button. And so you could say like, Hey, get by role button versus like, get me a button element directly. Cause your button may not actually be a button element. It might be an anchor tag or it might be a custom div tag that's made to look like yeah. an element or something like that. Playing mm-hmm. the button role. Yeah, but if but if you set up your aria attributes correctly, you would have given that div tag an aria dash roll a button, hmm. and then there's an advantage that you get to writing your t- um writing your tests with this philosophy, and that is that you kind of like have built in accessibility as well. Right. Sure. Um, so there is a yeah. another library called Cypress Testing Library that takes um, the testing library methods and makes them available inside of the Cypress API, um, attaching to the Cydot, whatever Fluent interface. Nice, and that that is what I like. Okay, that's the Eli test uh, philosophy. Yeah, and who makes the Cypress Testing Library? Um, it's a open source community. Um, mm-hmm. so it's actually a part. So the testing library is a larger, um, organization that kind of exists over the smaller libraries. So like React testing library, Cypress testing library, there's an Angular testing library, a view testing library, all these libraries that, um, subscribe to the API L- live under testing library. Yeah. Yeah. Can we test features that involve things outside the browser? Like what if we're doing some signal R stuff and going browser to browser? And, uh, you know, what if we're doing something that accesses the local system that, you know, downloads a file or something like that? Um, yep. is there any way to do that? I mean, anyth- anything that the browser does, um, you, you should be able to do inside of Cypress. So but what about two browsers? What I'm saying, what if you've got some two, two browsers at the same time is going to be more difficult just because we only load up inside of one browser. Okay. Um, so, but something that you can do to perhaps get around that is we have some network, um, mocking and intercepting built in. Mm-hmm. And so there, it's kind of like a, um, like a stubbing library. Okay. Where you can stub out network requests. And so if you're making a WebSocket request, you can stub that out and provide um, values for it instead of it actually talking to a second browser for real. Okay. But there isn't any way that I can, op- you know, open one browser and then do something and then open another browser, get the result of that and, m- and orchestrate both of those things under one test. I mean, there's probably a way. I think the challenge would be to be able to orchestrate that workflow and get it to like give you like reliable results right make it reliable that's what i would be worried about that sounds like a challenge for some alert listener who <laughs> wants to uh do a pull request there you that's go. what i'm thinking make a contribution make a contribution yeah because you are taking contributions yeah and speaking of that where do we go to uh take contributions here where's the what's the website where's the github repo or whatever uh, for for so, the cypress yeah, for the Cypress open source or mm-hmm. just Cypress in general? Yeah, the Cypress open source. Okay. Uh, so we're at GitHub. Uh, so github.com slash Cypress dash IO. Couldn't be easier. Um, and there you can find the main Cypress project and tons of example applications and the documentation. Okay. Well, pretty much all the stuff that we do is open source and including the docs. And so if you notice something like in our docs that's wrong, like you can go in and open up a PR and help fix up the docs as well. Make some edits to the docs. Improve great. the explanations. That's great. So what about large scale testing? So I've built up a big test suite now. It takes hours to run. Is there is there tooling to allow me to spread this across multiple workloads and try and speed things up? Yep. So the Cypress app itself 
Um, like I said, it's free. It's open source. It always mm -hmm. will be free. You can take it and use it to your heart's extent. We do have our commercial service, how we make money is called Cypress Cloud. And okay. it is for larger projects that are growing and it's to help you scale and give you analytics into your testing suite. Okay. And a few, a few of the things that it does is what, what you're just saying, Richard, is we can, you can use Cypress Cloud to scale out your testing across multiple instances to yeah. get a uh, parallel into your tests. Yeah. It's strange that we were always big on the being able to run the entire test stack in 15 minutes. Um, because okay. give enough time for the developer to stretch, tell, sw declare they are a god and this god needs coffee, go get <laughs> coffee. And by the time they got back from coffee, the test results are in and they were not a god after all. But the, the point being the code's still in their head when they get that error, the, the testing report back rather than having to figure out like, why did this fail? It's current enough. Like we, at one point, I think our test suite was running over a weekend. And so by the time Man. you got your test results, it was Monday and anybody could have written that code on Friday. You have no clue. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's, I, I really appreciate that the power of when we can rapidly do the tests and get it into the hands of the developer that they can, they, while well, that code's still in their head, they respond fast. Yep. Yeah. And that, that's the whole purpose of Cypress Cloud. It's about optimizing human time versus machine time. Right. Um, and so we do that sometimes by optimizing machine time, like spreading the workload over, or uh, we have a, a feature called smart orchestration that will run your tests in a, uh, in a manner that makes more sense. Like for instance, if for some reason you had a failure mm -hmm. and then you make a change and then you upload it with smart orchestration, it will actually run that failure first to make sure it passes versus you having to wait till like, if it was like test 999 out of a thousand that failed, you don't have right. to wait for the entire suite to go through again. Yeah. So some smart, uh, yeah, smart things to put the problem children up front, keep that cycle time down. Uh, yeah. And I'm looking at the pricing like that's pretty reasonable. You consider how much the test edition of studio cost back in the day mm -hmm. for, for the business product being $3,000 a year for 40 devs that, I'm not going to argue with that. That's pretty powerful stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you you only have to beat down one bad bug and you've paid for your test suite for the year. Right. <laughs> you know, that that's I look at that number and go, you can burn that in a weekend with four devs tearing their hairs out trying to fix a problem, right? Like if the tool can nail that down and at least let you roll back so you keep your weekend and you'll figure it out on Monday or can actually get it to fixed so that they don't they don't spend the whole weekend fighting it i'm all for that yep indeed awesome S so what's next what's on the horizon for you <laughs> cypress 13 <laughs> of course. Uh, cypress 13 is definitely next. When uh, so, what? So, yep so right now uh, we're definitely looking at ways to make the developer experience of cypress better and so that's a big focus of the uh, upcoming 13 release which is probably going to be slated for the fall sometime so we're looking at a uh, a lot of API changes um, for stuff that the community is looking for. But only one major version number in a year? How slack. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> your reputation. Yeah. Well, what will your otherwise. marketing people do? Only one set of logos to make? <laughs> uh, but yeah, also continuing like to um, make the developer experience of component testing better because that's one thing that people originally fell in love with was Cypress yeah. is that the developer experience, like writing tests before was kind of painful, not really all mm. that fun. You can yeah. get up and running testing with Cypress in like minutes and it's a little relaxing to sit there and be able to write like tests over and over that aren't like stressing you mentally that are passing and all that kind of fun stuff. And so that's, we're, we're kind of really die hard at just making it as simple as possible to write cool. tests. Very good. All right. Anything that we missed that you want to mention? Any shout outs? Uh, no, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Eli, thanks. Thanks a lot. This is good stuff and great. And thanks for answering our questions. And it sounds like a great product. Again. Absolutely, guys. My pleasure. All right. And we'll talk to you next time on .NET Rocks. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net, 
and produced by Plop Studios, a full-service audio, video, and post-production facility located physically in New London, Connecticut, and of course in the cloud. Online at pwop.com. Visit our website at dotnetrocks.com for RSS feeds, downloads, mobile apps, comments, and access to the full archives going back to show number one, recorded in September 2002. And make sure you check out our sponsors. They keep us in business. Now go write some code. See you next time. Got a transmitter band by the MCU.